So glad you guys are here. How are you enjoying the heat wave in Hampton Roads this weekend? Everybody enjoying that? Having a great time with that? 100 degrees yesterday. It's going to be 177 today. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we're just going to melt and have a great time. Glad you guys are here. I'm excited to be with you. I love our church. I love what God is doing through Community Church and getting to be a part of it is an awesome, awesome thing. For you guys maybe new, you don't know, we're on a mission to reach 25,000 people with the love and hope of Jesus in Hampton Roads by the year 2025, and I, I just get to see every week we get closer and closer to doing that, that God is just showing up every week, and we get to see more and more of it, so I'm excited. I want to welcome you guys here at Western Branch. Glad to have you, you guys at Kempsville campus as well, and we have a lot of people online watching right now, people from all across Virginia every week, but people in Washington, D.C., D.C., Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Arkansas, Florida, North Carolina, New York, Michigan, and South Korea. So let's welcome our online family this morning. So good to see so many people, what God is doing in Hampton Roads and obviously so far beyond. And I want to just say a special thing, uh, if you'll indulge me for a minute at Kempsville campus, uh, talking to you right now, just proud of you guys, what you guys are doing, uh, getting the privilege of leading uh, over there each and every uh, week, and it's just an awesome thing to see what God's doing in a new community there, excited about it. We know our best days are ahead. We believe the same thing for Suffolk as it comes online next year. So we're just excited. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get into our time together with this message. So Father, we just thank you right now for who you are for the amazing things that you do that we get to be a part of. And I just pray right now that you would truly use this time to speak into our lives in a way that only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're doing a series called Things of Legend, the Things of Legend. We're in week three of that series. And what this series is really about is the idea of that we believe big, bold prayers to God results in amazing things and legendary things. We've looked through some legendary people in the Bible over the last couple weeks and the things they've done and how that inspires us to, to just believe big for God. And you know, as I was thinking about this uh, message for this weekend, uh, just going through it in my mind, I was like, what, what would it like to feel like you're legendary? Like, what, what, what it must be like to know that you're legendary in some way? What is that feeling like? And, and it hit me as I was thinking over this a few days ago, that if you have kids, you'll definitely relate to this. Uh, I have four kids at home, and, and so just pray for me about that. It's a fun time. Um, but, but when the kids are little, it's so cool how they can inspire you so easily. And so when the kids are small and they're like two, three years old and they're just learning everything for the first time and they're amazed by all the simple things that, that we do every day and you do little things and they're like, wow, dad, you can do that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. They're like, dad, you can fix this? Yeah, it's just a piece of tape. Yeah, I can fix this. And, they get, and they'll think you're the greatest thing ever. Uh, I remember taking my oldest son out to the driveway to play basketball one day. He was probably about two and a half, somewhere in that range. And uh, so I shot a couple of shots, made three in a row. Pretty impressive, right? Um, I was about five feet away on about a seven-foot goal. <laughs> because I had it out there for him to play, and I made a couple of shots. He goes, Dad, are you like the greatest basketball player ever? Well, yes, son, of course. <laughs> of course I am, I'm the, because I'm the only one you've ever seen, so I'm the best you got. Um, but it's amazing how you feel so good. My daughter, she's a teenager now, but when she was younger and she was in elementary school, her school did a whole lot of, like, plays and uh, activities and parties and field trips. And so I went on a couple uh, in the beginning, and I guess I just connected with a lot of kids in her class. And so every time something would come up, she'd come running home. She'd go, hey, we got something else going on at school. And all the kids in my class want to know if you're coming because they think you're the coolest dad ever. And I want you to be there because I think you're the coolest dad ever. You know, and you're like, man, this is, this is nice. I like this. This makes me feel good. Maybe this is what legendary is like. And, and then your kids become teenagers. And, <laughs> and, and everything that made you legendary now becomes annoying and embarrassing. And I think that's just God's way of keeping us humble. Teenagers are God's way of keeping us humble. That's, that's what they're for. That's, that's their purpose. Now, I love my, love my teenagers. They are actually still very encouraging in my life. But I think about this. Like, what is it like to think that we can be legendary? And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just say from conversations I've had with a lot of people over the years, most of us don't really believe that we're going to be legendary people. A lot of us would like to think we could do great things. We don't necessarily believe we're going to do great things. And, and as I was thinking about what it means to be legendary I realize this is just a simple truth for all of us. We all want to be significant. I mean, we all want to live a life that matters. We all want to know that, that the life we're living isn't just pointless, that there's a meaning to it, that there's a purpose behind it, and the things that we're doing is, is more than just our lives. It impacts those around us. Every single one of us, if we were told, hey, if you do this, you'll become legendary, and you'll make a great and positive impact on the world you live in, everyone will say, yes, sign me up. I want to do that. I want to experience that in my life. 
And yet most of us don't experience what that feels like. And why is that? And I think it's because we don't necessarily understand what it takes to get there. And we don't necessarily maybe believe that it's for us. And here's what I want you to hear today. Every single one of us can be legendary because we have a God who created each and every one of us with great plans for our lives, great plans for our lives. He wants to do great things in our lives and through our lives. And so by default, every one of us is meant to be legendary, meant to be legendary and make an impact on the world we live in that changes the people around us. And so today we're going to spend some time looking at what does it take. The title of this message is The Making of a Legend. How do we get to be legendary? And I think about, you know, names when we hear legendary names. You, you, hear, you hear names like Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, Sam Powell. And, and you hear these names, and they just bring awe and inspire you because of the things they've done in their life. They just inspire you. And you're like, man, I wish I could put a mark on the world like they did. And I'm here to tell you you can. I'm here to tell you that you can today. <laughs> Didn't expect you to laugh that long. It's not that funny. It's not that funny. Now, um, but here's what I want you to get, and, and, I, and I do. I, I really i have been praying so much for this, that, that this would sink in. I want you to think about this. I just, just participate with me, Kentsville, even if you're watching online. Just, I am made to be legendary. Just say that out loud. I am made to be legendary. And let that sink in. What would happen if you really believed that? What might change if you really believe that about your life and what God wants to do? And so today we're going to look at a story to learn how from 1 Samuel. Samuel is the book of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the, the part of the Bible before Jesus. The New Testament is the part after Jesus came. And in 1 Samuel, we're going to see a story about this lady named Hannah, who's going to show us a lot about what it takes to become legendary. And we're going to learn so much through her story. So let's jump into it, 1 Samuel Chapter 1, we're going to go through a lot of 1 Samuel. Skip around just a little bit. So there was a man named Elkanah. In verse 2 it says, Elkanah had two wives. This is very significant. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah did not. We're going to come back to this part pretty often here this morning. Each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. Verse 4, it says, on the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. It says year after year, think about this now, year after year, it was the same thing. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? Now, I'm not going to get into why the husband here has no idea what to say to his wife in a moment like this. That's, that's a whole different message. But here's the point of the story. So here's this man, he's got two wives, right? The one has given him a, lot, a few children that we know of, and the one has given him no kids. He says he loves Hannah, but she hasn't given him any kids. And the other wife, year after year after year, just continues to mock the other wife for what she hasn't been able to do for her husband. She just to just beat her down so much emotionally that she is brought to tears each and every time this subject comes up. And so year after year, she's going through the same situation where things just aren't going her way, and she ultimately just feels like a failure, and that she has no value, and that why does her life even matter? She's at this point of going, what, what's even the point? What's even the point? And, and, I would, and I know the reality is many of us can understand Hannah in this situation. That we've probably gone through periods of our life, and maybe we're in one now, to where we've just not been able to do or accomplish some of the things we thought we wanted to do or should be able to. And not only are other people being able to be more successful in some ways, but some even throw it in our face all the time, what we haven't been able to do, and it just starts to just tear us down more and more and more as the days and the months and the years go on in our life. And I know there's many of us that ultimately just, we kind of feel like failures. We kind of feel like we don't have any real value, and we're just trying to figure out, does this even make sense anymore? 
And I'm here today again just to tell you, you were made to be legendary. You were made to be legendary. And so that's a lie that you've heard. It's a lie you've told yourself. It's a lie that's been going around that you have no value because you are significant. You are significant to God and to the world you live in. And so we have her husband. He tries to console her. He does the best he knows how to do uh, to no avail. Um, maybe you've had people in your life, friends or some family, that have tried to encourage you and lift you up in those, in those times of struggle when you've, been, when you've been really just hurting about some things. And it just let's just be honest. We know when, when we're in a place in our life where we don't know our life is making sense, it's really not a whole lot of people can say that really makes that feel better. We know people try, and we appreciate their effort, but it's just, it just doesn't seem to do an awful lot of times. And that's where Hannah is. That's where we've been a lot of times in our life. And here's what I want you to understand in this story. It's significant to know in this time period. So Hannah, obviously he has, he has two wives, and a lot of times people ask, why do they have so many wives in, in, in the Bible at certain points? And, and one of the main reasons you'll see in the Bible, one of the main reasons we know culturally that they would have multiple wives is because having an heir, so having your lineage carried on, having someone else to take your name, having a son to carry your name on was one of the most significant things in this time period. And so if you had a wife that wasn't able to have children, then it was, it was just accepted that, hey, I need to have someone else in my life that can have kids because my name must be carried on. Our lineage must continue. And so if they had a wife that didn't, that didn't have children, they would take on another wife. Sometimes they would even take on a servant just to, just to have a kid because that was so important. So think about who Hannah is right now. Her most significant role as a wife is to have a kid, and she can't do it. That's her most significant role. That's her most significant purpose in this moment, is to give her a husband a child to carry on their name, and she can't do it. Yet, Penina is able to, and just keeps throwing this in her face, and we see why Hannah's in the place she's in, where she's just in tears. Why does it have to be this way? And many of us feel the same way so often, in our life, and I, and I would believe that there's people that are listening right now that you've gotten to a point where, where you've just started to settle for how life is. You've just started to, to just settle for, well, this is how it is. This is probably how it's going to be. I don't really know if it's going to get better at this point. I'll just have to learn how to deal with this life this way. And I would say your dreams have probably just slowly been wiped away. Your hope has probably diminished over time, and you've just become complacent with what you would have said years ago would have never been enough. And nobody wants to live that way. And I can tell you, God certainly doesn't want that for you. God says, I want you to live fully alive. I want you to experience the most life has to offer. I want you to experience the greater things of life. That's not what he wants for us. He says, I want you to be legendary and experience things you never imagined were possible for your life. So don't settle for the things that are going on right now. Don't settle because your circumstances may not be what you think they should be. Don't settle because you believe lies along the way. Don't settle because you've made mistakes in the past. Don't settle because God wants so much more for your life. You are meant to be legendary. That's what God wants to do. And so I believe it just takes, I believe for many of us, it just takes a moment. It just takes a single moment where God changes everything for us to just get back where he wants us to go, to get back on the line and the track that he has for us to experience some of those things. And I would say for some of you that in this moment right now, what if, what if, just really think about that, what if, what if you were to really listen over these next few minutes and let God awaken your heart, renew your hope, restore your dreams, and have you leave today just a completely different person knowing I am meant to be legendary and I'm going to live out that life. That's what I want for you. That's my prayer for you. And so we're going to continue with Hannah's story to see how we get there. So think about this. Hannah's childless. She doesn't have kids. She's being taunted. She's hurting. She's reduced to tears. In, chapter, in verse 9, it goes on to say this. It says, once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and she went to pray. I'll make sure you're with me. So say, she went to pray. Amen. Awesome. You guys at Coopsville, make sure you're talking with me too. Keep it going, right? So she went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. This is a significant part. Say, she prayed to the Lord. Amen. All right, we've got to remember this part. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. 
So here's what I want you to know. If you're taking notes, and if you were here last week, you should be taking notes because the message was called Write It Down. So take notes. Here's what you need to know. Legendary status comes from legendary moments. Legendary status comes from legendary moments. So Hannah has been going through this year after year after year. This isn't new. This isn't new, right? It says year after year, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. They go to the tabernacle. They go to see God. They go to do sacrifices. Peninna gives her a hard time. She breaks down in tears. She goes home. They come back next year. She gives them a hard time. She breaks down in tears. She goes home. But here's what's significant in the story that we're reading right now. It says this time, Hannah did something different she's ever done before. It says she got up this time after the meal, and she went to the temple, and she went, what? You said this. She went to pray to God. And something different happened. See, she seized a moment to go, you know what? I don't have to settle for the way it's always been. There's something different I can do that can change the course of my life. That can change the course of what I'm experiencing. That can change what I'm going through. It is moments that make people legendary. It's not just something that just happens. It's moments that they capture that cause them to be legendary. And I'm a sports guy, so if you're a sports person, you can relate to this very easily. I mean, when I think about legendary people, I think of people like Michael Jordan, legend, not just because he was so great, because of the moments that he did things that nobody else had done before. The Olympics are going. How many of you guys like the Olympics? How many of y'all are watching the Olympics? I love watching the Olympics. It's so much fun. We don't have cable at our house. We actually went and bought one of those cheap air antennas just so we could get Channel 10 so we could watch the Olympics over the last couple of weeks. So my wife and I have enjoyed that, uh, but I love it. And you know, there's so many legendary experiences in the Olympics. Michael Phelps is just like ridiculous, legendary Anybody who wants to swim for longer than 16 years better have some good moments in their life because uh, it has to make that significant, right? Uh, but you think about that. You think about football season's coming up, right? I love football. Football's coming up. I can't wait for that to happen. I am, and you can keep your judgment to yourself, a Patriots fan. And so I love the Patriots, and uh, I love watching them. And it's hard for me to talk about legendary people without mentioning Tom Brady, uh, who has become a legend in the NFL because of the moments when he was a backup quarterback and somehow ended up in the Super Bowl and took his team on a last-minute drive to win their first Super Bowl ever and did it multiple times after that. Man, if you're not sensing the Spirit of God right now, I'm telling you. But this is legendary, right? If you want to be legendary, I mean, we can make it very simple. I'll make legendary easy for you. Here you go. I'll help you out. If you want to be legendary, get you one of these. Just put that on, and you will feel legendary in a moment. Okay, just make sure that side will really get you. Just make sure. Told you I had a couple sons. That's one of their names. Just saying. It was my wife's idea. Don't judge me. All right. So, um, but that's what it takes, a legendary moment, right? It takes a legendary moment. It takes moments that we capture and that we seize that actually leads us to a legendary moment. Status. Now, here's a couple things I want you to know. I can put on Tom Brady's jersey. I'll never be Tom Brady. He may have done some legendary things wearing that jersey. That does nothing for my life. Here's one thing you got to get out of that. You can't live a legendary life based off what somebody else has done. You're going to live a legendary life based off what you do. And so you've got to capture some legendary moments in your life to live the amazing things God has for you. But we're not just talking about sports. I mean, that, that's, that's a great thing, but we're talking about world-changing, life-changing, supernatural things of God that make us legendary. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about capturing some moments with God that changes everything. And so as we look at that, we're going to continue in this story in verse 12 where Hannah took a hold of a moment and instead of focusing on everything that was wrong about her life, she decided to focus on God. And it says, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded? Throw away your wine. Oh, no, sir, she replied. I'll just, just stop right there for a second. Because it's important that when you read the Bible that you make sure you read it good. Because there's a lot of times when I'm reading the Bible and I stop in the wrong spot. And if you stop here, you may be thinking, Eli said, hey, are you drunk? Throw away your wine. And she goes, oh, no, sir. <laughs> and you're like... You're thinking, did she just say, I'm not throwing away my wine, I'm going to keep right drinking right here in the temple? <laughs> but, but, but that's not what she said. And, and if you're a teenager, you understand this. Commas save lives. And so it's very important we read it the way it's written because it changes things. She didn't say, oh, no, sir. She said, oh, no, sir. And she says, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. 
See, the only thing that changed this time from every other time is she decided to capture a moment and say, you know what, instead of trying to deal with this on my own, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to go to God. And I'm just going to pour my heart out to him and say, I need you. I need you right now. And, then, and she, when you look at the God, when you look at God like she did, and you start asking for something miraculous, you start ask, asking for something that's incredible, that can't happen otherwise outside of God, then you start to see legendary things happen in your life. You start to see some amazing things happen in your life. Pastor Michael, uh, when he was talking with us last week, said, God is not limited by time or space, which means there's nothing God can't accomplish. Hannah understood that. Hannah, when she was praying, said, to the Lord of heaven's armies. I mean, she understood, if you're the God of heaven, then surely you can give me a son if that's what you want to do. This is nothing outside of the possibility for you to do. You definitely have the power to give me a son if you choose to do that because you're God. And when we start thinking that way, our view of God changes everything about our life. How you view God will change how you think. It will change how you dream. It will change how you pray. It will change how you ask God for things. And when you start seeing God for who he is, and you start asking God for things that are greater than anything else could offer, then you start to experience the greater things that God has for your life. It's when you go to him and say, God, I need you to do what only you can do, because surely you can, because you are God. That's when God shows up. That's when you see the results that you're after. And that's what Hannah experienced. Her view of God changed her life. I love this part, that she took this moment she was broken. She was in anguish. She says deep sorrow and anguish. She cried out to God. And this is, this is a great part. It goes on to say in verse 16, don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then, and this is so significant, it says then she went back, began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. Then, after going to God, then she was no longer sad. So here, here's the interesting thing about this story. So we know she's in deep anguish. She's had years of this ridicule she's gone through and feeling like a failure. She goes to God in this moment. She cries out to God. She comes back, and she's no longer sad. Why is she no longer sad? Here, here's a very important thing. See, nothing about her circumstances have changed. See, a lot of times we think, oh, well, things will get better when God does something. Things will get better when I see my circumstances change. Nothing about her circumstances have changed. See, she's going back to the same husband who has no idea what to say in the right times. She's going back to the same other wife who's going to ridicule her because she still has no kids. She's going back to the same home that she's been at for the last several years where she's felt like a failure. And she's planning on coming back to this place again next year in the same situation she was already in. However, she felt not feeling sad anymore. Why? Because here's the difference. When you go to God, even if he doesn't change your circumstances, he changes you. He'll change you. And he doesn't always have to change your circumstances. Sometimes he just needs to change you a little bit. And that changes everything. That changes everything. When you put your trust in God, it changes everything. We, we, we've been saying over this series, go big, pray big, think big, have big dreams. If you want to go big, then go to the one who can accomplish big things. Going big means involving God. Going big means involving God. Get him involved in big things. Going to God. Have big dreams. Ask big questions. Because when you start going to God, he's going to do some stuff. He's going to do some things. Your circumstances may not change like you thought they would, but God's going to show up, and he may just change you. And that's probably the best thing you need in the moment. Here's one thing that I know when we talk about this kind of thing. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. I mean, if you look deeper at this story, Hannah didn't go to God because she goes, You know what? I think I just want to get closer to God right now. So I'm going to go pray. It's not what happened. She's like, I'm just completely torn apart right now. My life is a failure. I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to go to God. God, if you'll give me a son, if you'll give me a son, it'll fix everything. It'll please my husband. It'll get that other woman off my back. I'll feel like I've accomplished something in life. If you'll just give me a son, that'll fix all my problems. She goes to God. She comes back not feeling sad, not because she had a son, because she spent some time with God. That's all he was after in the first place. Here's what I would tell you. We, we know that when we go through a lot of this in our life, I, I wrote this down because I want to make sure I said this because it just hit me the other day really hard. Uh, I wrote this down. Just like most kids, if you have kids, you understand this. They'll come to us because they want to get their requests fulfilled, not because they want to be with us. And as a parent, you know how much that hurts. You're going to fulfill their requests because that's what a loving parent does. 
but you'd much rather they just come to you because they want to be with you. Ain't God the same? Why wouldn't God be the same way? So often we go to him and we just throw our request out going, hey, if you'll just fix this for me, everything will be great. And he goes, I just wish you would just come to me. Then I'll just, I'll really fix the problems then. I'm going to do other things for you because that's how good God is. I'm going to answer your questions anyway because that's who I am. It's just how he shows up. So dream big. Dream big. Right, here's what I would tell you. Hey, if you're going to dream big, and, and maybe you got the wrong dream. See, what happens is Hannah went to God for the wrong reason, and God still showed up in her life. Maybe right now you got a dream in your life. This is not even the right dream for your life, and you don't even know it's the wrong dream for your life. Man, go after it with everything you got. Get it wrong really big. Get it wrong really big. And I'll tell you, because what's going to happen is if you're going God to answer it, then God will get you where you need to be if it's the wrong dream. Because the more you get to know God, the more you'll get to know his heart, and he'll put the right dreams in your heart, and he'll show you the dream you had wasn't even close to the dream that he has, and now you go after the dream he has, and you'll experience so much more than you thought that dream would have ever offered you in the first place. And you go, thank you, God, for this, because that's so much better. And I even know that was possible before, but now that I've gotten to know you some, I've gotten to experience something so much better for my life. Thank you, Jesus. That's what God wants. That's what God wants to do. That's what he wants to do in our life. So go big. Matthew 7 says, ask, it'll be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. Who seeks, finds. One who knocks, it will be open. Maybe you've been praying a specific prayer for a while. You've been hearing this series and you're like, I've been, pastor, you just don't know. I've been, I've been going at it and praying and seeking God for some big things and, and he just hasn't shown up yet. And I don't know if he's going to answer. And Pastor Michael is going to talk specifically about that, just praying long-term and seeking God through that next week. But here's the one thing I want you to know in the meantime. Here's the one thing I want you to hear. God really put on my heart. Know this. If you spend hours in prayer to God about something, if you spend years in prayer to God about something, here's what you have to know. Whether your circumstances change or not, God does not waste time. He will not waste your time. He will not waste his time. If you are going to him, I can promise you, even when it seems like God is doing nothing, God is doing something because God is always doing something because that's who he is. He does not waste your time. So don't believe it's been wasted. Verse 19 says, the entire family got up early the next morning, went to worship the Lord. They returned home. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. Man. Man. She goes home, and she ends up pregnant. She has a kid. God just answered. You know, I can relate to that. My wife and I, we, I told you I have a daughter, Emily. She's 15 now. When we first had her, we had this idea of we wanted to have a big family, and we are like, I don't know how many kids we want to have. We were like, we'll have three, four, five, 12. I don't know. We'll just, we'll just keep having them and see how it goes. And, and so we had Emily, and, and a year later, and, and two years later, and, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven years later, uh, we had Emily, and, and I'm not... Don't take that the wrong way. We were great we had Emily. We were like, man, I just really feel like you put it in our heart to have a, a big family. What was going on? And eight years of, of just praying and just expecting to have more kids and, and nothing's happening. And, and then right before Emily turned nine, a situation worked out with my niece, uh, who was just a year older than her, uh, came to live with us, and she's still with us now. So we've had her for the last seven years. But what happened is, is, is Allison showed up just a few months uh, before, she, before Emily turned nine. And then that year, uh, my wife got pregnant with who was Brady now. And then the year after that, she got pregnant who was Ethan now. So we went from one to four in two and a half years, and I was like, God, I want you to answer, but not all at one time. <laughs> I was hoping to spread this out a little bit. But he showed up. But I can tell you how appreciative we are that God answered. And we love having all the kids around the house. But here's what Hannah did. Another moment in Hannah's life that led her to being legendary. Verse 24 says, when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh, it goes on to say they brought the boy to Eli, and she looks at Eli. She says, sir, do you remember me, Hannah asked? I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he's granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. What's the result for Hannah? She cried out to God. Things started changing. Her life started changing. Her circumstances even changed. She had the baby she always dreamed of having, and yet she didn't hesitate to even give him away. Imagine this. The years of anguish that she went through, she finally has the kid she desires, she has her child, and she just gives him right back to God. Isn't it amazing that through those years of prayer, during that time, that her connection with God became more important than her own dreams? That her connection with God became bigger than even the dreams that she had for herself? 
you know, I, I have, the, I have, you know, more kids now, and I just, I think about this story, and I go, man, after eight years of wanting more kids, and then getting to have more kids around the house, I can't imagine giving any of you up, <laughs> you letting any of them go, I, I just want to be with me all the time, and I got a taste of this just a few weeks ago, I'll share a quick story with you, and it's, it's a, uh, it's a very transparent story, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but we had a bunch of friends over the house a, a few weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon. Actually, a, a, a lot of some families from Kentsville. We were spending some time with them and hanging out. Had a big cookout. And uh, so we were just a whole bunch of people, kids running all over the place and, and adults in the house. And so a few of us decided to go for a walk uh, to the park in our neighborhood because we believe in health and fitness. And so most of us let's just go for a walk. It's 100 degrees outside. Um, and the real reason is because we wanted to play Pokemon Go and, and, caps and get some Pokemon. And so, so yeah, don't judge me. Um, and so, so a few of us said, hey, we're going to leave the house. Let's go play Pokemon. And we're like, yeah, it's going to be great. So we all break out our phone, and there's like 12 adults, none of the kids. So there's like 12 adults walking around the neighborhood trying to catch Pokemon. And somehow, you know, communication, whatever it might be, uh, we thought some people were in the house, some people were playing Pokemon. I guess it got some confusion there. And as we're coming back home, my wife walks up to the house, and there's a, a police officer there, and he goes, hey, just want to double check with you, make sure everything's okay. We got a phone call that a neighbor brought uh, your, your three-year-old son back to your house. He was walking through the neighborhood trying to find his mom and dad because he wanted to play Pokemon too. Yeah, it's great times. Um, so, so one of our neighbors, I guess Ethan, at some point decided, hey, mom and dad, where do they go? And somebody said, oh, they're playing Pokemon. Oh, I want to play. So he goes out the front door to find us. Uh, he gets down the street a little bit. One of the neighbors sees him, brings him home. But uh, I guess somebody else had seen him driving by and called 911 and said, hey, there's some kid walking around the neighborhood. He's about three years old. And so the police officer talked to my wife. And it's, it's just a good story because he asked, he said, so were, were y'all out playing Pokemon? We were like, yeah, yeah. He goes, did you catch anything? <laughs> well, no, nothing real good. He's like, okay, well, you have a nice day. So, so uh, but, but, you know, in that moment, it was just, it's kind of a funny story. But I will tell you, later that night, honestly, it kind of hit me. It hit me really hard later that night. I was like, man, what if something had happened? What if something happened? And I got really sick to my stomach thinking about what, what if something had happened to him? And I look at Hannah's story, and I go, man, years, years of desiring to have this child, and yet she just, she just gives them up to God because she connected with God in such a way she knew that was the best thing for him, and she wanted to honor God for answering her prayer. Here's the, here's the interesting thing about Hannah is we're reading out the book of Samuel. We're not reading out the book of Hannah. Hannah's legendary, but the book is named after her son. In fact, there's two books in the Bible named after Samuel. Why? Because Samuel is truly a legendary person in history. Samuel went on to be a major prophet for God, to do just great things for God, for the nation of Israel. Samuel was the one that actually appointed the first king ever to the nation of Israel. Samuel was the same one who told David when he was a little shepherd boy, hey, you're going to be king one day, and appointed him as king over the nation of Israel. Samuel was one that went on for a period of time as one of the main leaders in the nation of Israel for God to do great things. And yet, we look at Hannah's life and we go, if Hannah hadn't gone to God in the way she did, maybe Samuel wouldn't have even existed to do what he did. And here's what I would tell you. See, Hannah just simply had a dream of having a, of having a baby. God had a dream of doing so much more than that. Whatever dream you have, I'm telling you, it's a great dream and go after it. Because when you accomplish any dream God's put in your heart, not only will you feel really good about that, but you're going to be so amazed at how much more God does with that dream than you even thought was possible. So much more than you ever thought possible. We can be legendary. You can be legendary if we'll tap into the source that makes the impossible possible. So that's the last thing I have for you this morning. Becoming legendary starts with Jesus. Becoming legendary starts with Jesus. There was nothing legendary about Hannah until she turned to God, and it changed everything. It's the same way for us. John 15, 4 and 5, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. We all want to be significant. We all want to do great things. If we will remain in Jesus and trust him with our life and go to him like Hannah went to God, then we will bear good fruit in our life. We will see great results in our life lives that matter. There is no level of success that you will ever achieve, no money, no status, no power, anything that you will ever achieve on this earth that will match up to what happens when God uses your life. Nothing. There's nothing you will ever do that will compare to what happens when God uses your life to make a difference in the world we live in. 
And so Ephesians 3.20 is my prayer for you, to to just believe this, to put it on your refrigerator, whatever you have to do. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us. That's what we have to believe. That's what we have to believe, that if we can go to God, he's able to do immeasurably more than we can even think or ask because of the power that he has, that he wants to work in us to make a difference in the world we live in to do something significant with our lives, to be legendary people. I believe right, legendary moments is what creates legendary status. And I will tell you, I believe right now is a legendary moment for a lot of people listening. I believe this is one of those legendary moments where you can decide, hey, this sounds great, and you can just go on about your day. Or you can say, you know what? It does need to start with Jesus for me. That this is my moment to start being legendary, to go, I can't do this without God. And I need him in my life. And you capture this moment right now and you move forward believing what God wants to do in you and through you. For some of you, maybe you've been all in for Jesus for a while, but maybe your dreams have gotten kind of shallow. Maybe your dreams have just kind of gone away. Maybe you've forgotten what God's capable of. And today's the day that you need to revive some dreams. You need to increase your faith once again. Say, God, I, I just, somehow just along the way, I just forgot. I just forgot how great you, you are and what you can do. God, give me some new dreams today. Give me some new dreams today for the amazing things that you want to do in my life. Make this a moment that leads to legendary things for your life. Don't leave here today without seizing this moment because God wants to do so much in you. So for some of you, it's time to go all in for Jesus. It's time to go all in and say, you know what? I'm turning to you. I'm turning to you. Make my life matter. I trust you with it. And for some of you, say, God, give me a dream again. Help me dream again and watch what God does. So we're going to pray. If you'll pray with me for just that. So God, we just come to you right now. We just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are God who is able, (laughs) that you are able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or think. So God, right now, I I just pray for anyone in this room who is in a place where maybe they haven't been following you, they haven't been trusting you. And just like Hannah did in that moment, she goes, you know what, God, I'm just going to turn to you. I'm I'm tired of trying to figure this out on my own. I'm trying to do it myself. I'm just turning to you right now, God. I'm going to trust you. If you'll just do this in my life, I will just devote everything back to you. I want to experience everything that you have for me. I don't want to miss out on any of it. I want to know that my life matters and I know I can't do it without you. That God, I just, right now, in this moment, I want to capture, I want this to be a legendary moment in my life. If that's you in this place right now, uh, we got our eyes closed, just raise your hand. We just, just lift your hand as this way to God. Say, God, that's me. I want you to know it's me. That's where I'm at right now in my life. I just, I want it to be you. I want it to be you. Western Branch, Kimsville. Just, just, if that's you right now, God, I just, it's you. I, I want to go your way right now. Do something amazing in my life. So many of you raising your hands. Thank you for that. Just respond to God right now. For others of you, you can put your hands down. For others of you, again, if you're all in, just say, God, give me a new dream. God, I want a new dream right now. Ask him for it. He says, ask, he will answer. So God, we just ask you for new dreams right now. We thank you for those who are saying, I'm turning to you. I'm expecting great things. I'm expecting you to do amazing work from the power that you have within our lives. We're asking you for great dreams that you're going to give us, that we're going to believe for, that you're going to do, that we never thought was even possible. And yet we're going to look one day and go, man, that's pretty legendary. I didn't think it was possible that I could do something like that. But because I turned to you, you made it possible. So God, thank you for the dreams you've given me. Thank you for using it way beyond anything I could have ever imagined before you were so amazing Jesus so we thank you for what you're doing in this place we thank you that I believe right now today as we speak you are making legends in this house in Jesus name amen